Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Roundsburg City Schools Parent University. Tonight, we'll be talking about your child and social media. My name is Dr. Melvin J. Brown. I'm a superintendent for Roundsburg City Schools, and I'm extremely proud and excited about tonight and the opportunity to engage with you with some conversation that's very relevant to everything that we deal with, both in school and at home. Obviously, the things we've done over the past year or so have all been about COVID. Tonight, we are not talking about COVID, but being that we've been out of school uh, in, in the traditional sense for about a year, a year or so, these things may play an issue in terms of what it, our response to COVID. Uh, to this endeavor to do parent university is something that began uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Where we wanted to have a venue in which we could engage with parents and have parents engage with us to build connections and bridges that would allow us to be a more cohesive and, and communicative community that was moving in the right, in the same direction and doing the best things we can for students. Uh, so tonight, we're very, very proud and excited to go in this next venue of Parent University and talking about social media and the impact on kids. This venue that we'll be using throughout the, the time that we'll, we'll be uh, in school, we'll be doing this again next year. Parent University will be an ongoing thing. We look to see this as something that can help us to not only connect, but give opportunities for people to learn things they may not have known before and perhaps have some interest in coming and joining us as a, as a paraprofessional or a teacher at some point. Who knows? So I want to just basically thank you all for coming. It's obviously a beautiful night outside, and if you're having a chance to watch this, hopefully you're going to get outside. Uh, but we're, we're very pleased that you took the time to spend with us tonight and deal with this very important topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Baker, and I am your assistant superintendent here with Reynoldsburg City Schools. And it's a, a pleasure to, to be with you tonight. And uh, as Dr. Brown had said, I'm certainly so appreciative that all of you took the time this evening um, to be with us and talk about uh, your child in social media um, and how appropriate that we're doing this over technology. Um, you think those, those, uh, those two topics go hand in hand. Um, tonight's agenda just should be popping up on the screen for you to see and what we're going to be doing this evening. I will take a few moments and just go through the purpose of, of Parent University in general and what our intended outcomes are for tonight. Then we're going to look at social media and your child through three different lenses um, from the perspective, from the mental health perspective, and then also from the legal perspective. Um, we're going to take a few minutes and talk about the supports that are already in place for your child within our schools. Um, when we have issues or questions about social media. Um, and, and then we're going to, um, before we close, um, hear from our chief academic officer who has viewed an incredible documentary about um, social media called The Social Dilemma. And she's gonna kind of share her perspective, not only as an educator, but also as a mom um, on that documentary. And then we'll close things out for the evening. We should probably be together about minutes um, certainly, if you're not able to stay for the whole time tonight, um, we are recording this and the link for the event will be on our website. One other um, item I do want to make sure you, that you're aware of, um, as the moms and dads out there should know, um, some of our topics a little, later on in the evening might be a little sensitive to young ears. So you be the judge on, as moms and dads and, and decide if you want your kiddos in the room as we're talking about those things, because you know some of the other topics that can come up when we're talking about social media. Let's talk a little about the purpose of Parent University. Really, that's threefold. Um, we, our, our Parent University program is one main construct to try to increase the parent involvement in our schools. We certainly um, educate your child without you being involved, and this is a, a great opportunity for us to, to share some information and get you further involved in what we do every day with your child. Um, certain, also, sharing information that's going to influence that student experience um, both in and outside of school. When you think of social media, we use social media within the classroom as well as um, your child or, or your children using it on their own. And so we want to make sure we share some of that information that would be relevant and influence their use. And then certainly supporting you as parents and guardians as you are raising children 
um, to be successful, um, and not only in the school setting, but just in general. Um, and, and certainly that is what we all have in common, is that when we see our kiddos in Reynoldsburg City Schools, we all want them to, to, uh, to grow, to be successful, and thrive in, in life after they are with us. Let's talk a little about the intended outcomes for tonight. Um, we have four outcomes, and actually at the end of the evening, um, you will receive a link um, via your email um, address that you shared with us um, with a survey where you will be able to kind of evaluate us on whether or not we met our targets. And so please, as you're listening tonight, be thinking about these four outcomes. And um, in that survey, let us know how we did because how we accomplished our outcomes will drive um, how we then prepare for the upcoming parent university um, events. So our four outcomes for this evening, parents and guardians and caregivers will, um, one, understand positive ways for students to engage in social media. Um, we hear too often about the negative things that, um, that students take away from social media, but there are positive things out there, and we want to make sure you as, as moms and dads and guardians um, understand what, um, what, what those um, positive uh, outcomes are. Um, a second outcome for us this evening is to understand how we use social media within the school setting. Um, there are opportune times for us to tap into those social media tools um, for educational purposes, and we want you to be aware of those. A third outcome is to uh, recognize the signs of cyberbullying or trauma that can be caused um, from cyberbullying. Um, we see this way too often within our classrooms, within our schools, a lot of, the, of those, uh, those things that happen outside of schools end up finding their way into the school setting. And so we want to make sure that you're able to recognize those signs. And then finally, we want you as parents and guardians and caregivers to know who your primary contacts are um, at school when you start to notice those signs. So those are our four outcomes. We're fingers crossed that we're going to meet those outcomes for you tonight. Um, and with that, we're going to kick right into our presentations. Um, our first presentation tonight is from um, two of our fabulous school principals here in Reynoldsburg City Schools. We're going to hear from Don McLeod, who is the principal at Wagner Road Middle School, and Garla Brown, who is the principal of Reynoldsburg High School's HS Squared STEM Academy. And they're going to talk to you a little about social media from the school's perspective. I'll turn it over to Don and Garla. Good evening, everyone. And once again, my name is Garla Brown. I am the principal at the HS Squared STEM Academy, and I am happy to be here to share with you social media from the school's perspective. Um, and to let you know that there are definitely positive ways in which um, social media can be used uh, at the school and to help your kids stay connected. For instance, right now, um, it's important for students to stay connected with their friends. So social media is a great way in which to do that. And then also it's a great way to stay in the know as it relates to updates from the school as well as the district as a whole and also to receive resources. Um, the platforms that are oftentimes used for that are uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and Google Meets. In order to get the best um, benefits out of social media, it is important for you to discuss with your children how to use social media for educational purposes. For example, at HS Squared and our sociology class, students are doing an awareness campaign and they are connecting with uh, their peers through the use of YouTube uh, videos as well as Twitter campaigns. And then another way in which you could use it for educational purposes is that right now what we're learning is that children are becoming very strong advocates for um, issues that are occurring across the world. And so uh, social media is a great way in which to be educated on issues across the world. A great resource for uh, you as parents um, to find out other ways in which to use uh, social media for educational purposes is uh, verywellfamily.com. Once again, that's verywellfamily.com. And uh, Ms. McLeod, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Like Dr. 
Mr. Baker said, I'm Dom McLeod. I'm the principal of Wagner Road Middle School, and I was a former high school principal. And I also happen to be the mother of three grown children who all graduated from Reynoldsburg City Schools. So I have some experience with social media. I can tell you from my perspective as a mom that um, social media is your footprint your foot, footprint of who you are. So parents, we really need to take an active role in checking our child's social media and looking to see what are the things that they're liking or retweeting or commenting on. Because unfortunately, that also determines in society who they are. And so we really have to pay attention to what our kids are putting out there about their beliefs on social media. Maybe they're not even their beliefs. Sometimes they just like things and they don't realize it looks like it's their belief. Um, I have two boys that um, happen to play collegiate sports. One is actually now a college football coach. One has played college football. And I know for a fact that college coaches look at children's social media to see what kind of player am I going to recruit to be on my team? And so it's very important for us to monitor what's going on in social media and making sure that, you know, our kids are young and sometimes, you know, they don't think through things. They need an adult there to help them think through um, what's going on in social media. I also know from working with Ohio State um, for many years that their admissions officers look at social media when they're admitting students. Um, the example they gave was two students um, were admitted and they were up for very large scholarships and the students looked the same on paper. So what they did was went to their social media to determine who would get the scholarship. And they chose the student that social media was a little cleaner and um, just fit who they wanted to be admitting into their university. So I think it's important for us to keep that in the back of our minds that it, it does represent who we are. Um, and, and employers look at social media now too. So um, we can all do this together. We can, um, parents, we can monitor things um, and we can have those conversations with our children about what is appropriate. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Dave Baker. Great. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Garland. Thank you both so much, not only for um, presenting tonight and sharing your insights as professionals and as moms, um, but also for the work you do with our students and, and staff every single day. We appreciate the, the nurturing um, aspect you take um, when working with our kiddos and our staff. Um, we in Reynoldsburg City Schools are so very fortunate to have a strong partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital. Nationwide Children's Hospital is right in our backyard in downtown Columbus. Um, it is a, a facility that has grown many, many times over over the years, and that's very exciting for our community. And to know that um, they now have a footprint in Reynoldsburg City Schools. If you've not been over to the Livingston Avenue campus of Reynoldsburg High School, um, there is a school-based healthcare clinic there. Um, in um, kind of that northeastern corner of the building, um, closest to the street. Um, and we have a full clinic. We've converted two of our classrooms into a full clinic that um, serves both physical health, mental health, and sports wellness um, for our students. And we're so very lucky to have that facility and that partnership for our kids um, in the district. And a kind of a perk of having that partnership is we get two people like Andrea Weisberger and Ed Mojis who are willing to share with us tonight um, a little about social media from that mental health perspective. As I shared, one of the services that Nationwide Children's offers to our students is mental health support. And um, certainly they are a wealth of knowledge. And I was so thrilled when Andrea and Eden agreed to be a part of tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Andrea and Eden from Nationwide Children's um, to talk to us a little about how they view social media and supporting um, our students. Thank you, David, and thank you, Dr. Brown, and all Reynolds Park staff for opening your door and partnering with us. As David has stated, I am one of the clinical lead supervisors for the Behavior Health School Base at the Nationwide Children's Hospital. I oversee other suburban schools, but one of them is definitely exciting is Reynoldsburg City School. Um, I just want to say I'm going to 
have Andrea take the big lead in all this. Um, but I just want to say to remind everybody, mental health is inclusive of all ages. But we know with children, they're the most vulnerable ones. It doesn't matter if they're in kindergarten or 12th grade. They are limited in understanding social media. Obviously, we know it a bit more than they do. But for, for you as parents, as you hear all of us, don't feel like you're doing something bad. Give yourself grace and just know that you're not alone. We're here to support you. And with that, I'm going to have Andrea break it down in different ideas of what um, happens, what we can do, and how to support one another. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Ed and I are both so happy to be here with you guys today from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, the first thing I want to address and talk about is actually the social and emotional benefits of social media. Um, and I think that it's important to talk about this because a lot of times we talk about the negative things. But again, you know, we heard from the school about positive things that you know, our children and teens can get out of it from the school side. So I'm going to talk about that mental health side and why it can be good for them. First one is social networking and building of a community. Um, teens especially can connect with other teens from literally any part of the world. And that's a really wonderful thing about social media. If a teen feels maybe disconnected, disconnected from the other students in their own school, they literally have a friend group at their fingertips um, who might share their interests. Or have, they might have things in common with them. The next one is increasing self-worth. So they can share triumphs, accomplishments, and positivity over social media. Um, and although getting likes and retweets isn't everything, it's still something to them. And it's an acknowledgement that other people respect and like what they have to say or like what you've done or created. Next one is increased feeling heard. Um, children and teens in our more vulnerable populations, they might not have someone um, in their school that is like them um, or can understand what they're going through. So if they put a thought or a feeling out there on social media and a person says, you know, comments back and says, yeah, I agree, I feel that way too, it really helps them to get validation for their experience. The next one I think is kind of self-explanatory, connecting with friends and family, but at the same time, um, I have to share, I have teenagers who will FaceTime with their grandparents every single night before bed. Um, and isn't that just an amazing thing? Um, grandparents who live maybe across the country or right now, I know we talk a lot about COVID, social media has been their outlet in so many different ways and being able to keep connected from friends or family that they're not otherwise able to see on an everyday basis. And then this last one, increased exposure to other worlds. Um, they, they can be exposed to other foods, different music, dance, everything when it comes to social media, um, communities and worlds that they've never seen before. It can also really help raise awareness of issues around the world and increase their desire to help others, um, whether it's the neighbor across the street or if it's a person halfway around the world. So we'll go to the next slide where we're talking about the social emotional drawbacks <laughs> um, of social media and maybe how social media may impact um, their mental health. Obviously, we know cyberbullying is a huge issue. Um, and the unfortunate part is cyberbullying is often a silent issue. So t children or teens are often sharing these issues with their friends and saying, oh, this person said this or this person did that. And also their friends have their social media, so they're seeing it live, um, but they might not always share it with you or with me or an adult. Um, and we can talk later on about how to encourage them to talk more with you about it. The next one is, of course, this lowered self-esteem and lowered self-worth. Um, obviously, getting likes um, feels really good um, and it's validating. However, when it becomes our only source of validation, that's where it becomes problematic. Uh, also, the comparison to other people is a really big issue. So. Um, them seeing pictures of uh, Instagram influencers and um, constantly being bombarded with pictures of, let's say, the ideal body, the ideal life, the ideal hair, ideal muscles, like whatever it is. Um, this can really lead to feelings of being less than and having that lowered self-esteem and self-worth. And that's, that's a really um, significant drawback, I believe. So on this next slide, we're going to talk about the healthy versus the unhealthy um, uses of social media. On the left side, you'll see maintaining reasonable hours is, of course, a healthy <laughs> example of uh, social media. So, um, you know, I say during normal day hours or maybe earlier in the evening, but of course, an unhealthy 
um, use of social media would be being on the phone or your computer all night long, constantly scrolling, constantly looking to see what's new, who's posted at 3 a.m. Um, that might not be the healthiest for our children and teens. And let's all be honest, for ourselves. <laughs> um, the next one on the left side, another healthy use of it is connecting online and in person. Um, so obviously on the other side of that, um, an unhealthy behavior um, or use of social media would be only connecting with others online. We really want to have a nice balance between connecting with other people online, but also having this in-person interactions as well. And then this last one under healthy behavior, um, that maintaining a good balance between social media, home life, school, social stuff, that kind of thing. An unhealthy behavior might be um, <laughs> allowing social media to distract us from important things, such as our school, family, or I would even say friends, obligations as well. Um, those things that we really would like to see <laughs> um, outside of just being on your phone. So these are um, signs um, to identify the unhealthy use of social media. Um, the first one right here is, you know, like we were talking about those unhealthy behaviors of um, uh, social media use, uh, interrupted sleep patterns. Um, are they up all night? Are they tired all day? Are they napping in the afternoon? Um, now, of course, with some teenagers, they just tend to be um, the napping type of teen, and that's okay. Um, but at the same time, if they're having some really irregular um, and concerning sleep patterns. That might be something for you to um, uh, look out for. Um, and that might be connected to some, you know, unhealthy social media use. The next one is increased anxiety. And I talk with parents, you know, as a counselor, I talk with parents a lot about both in, what does anxiety look like and what does depression look like? So let's first talk about anxiety. Um, Underneath anxiety, we have these excessive worries about likes. So I laugh because, you know, um, I, I think a lot of times with adults, um, we're like, well, any worrying about likes is unhealthy, which isn't true. You know, it's it's to a certain degree, this is their life. You know, this is this is how they now interact. This is what they expect socially is getting likes. So we want to be understanding of that. Um, but where it gets excessive, um, worrying about getting enough likes, they're constantly talking about it. Their best friend didn't like their post or they, you know, evolve into tears because their boyfriend or girlfriend didn't like their post, or maybe their boyfriend and girlfriend liked someone else's post. So we want to look out for that excessive worry, not just the everyday, like, oh man, not enough people liked this. Um, it's when it's happening all day, every day, and it's causing real significant, um, uh, worry. The next one is negative body image. Um, often our teens um, don't really realize that pictures are posted um, and they're often edited or posed in a specific way to be the most flattering to the person taking the picture. Um, so when they then see their own pictures, they might think, oh, oh, I wish I was thinner. I wish I had more defined muscles in my arms. I wish my skin was clearer. All of those kinds of things. So when we start seeing them thinking or talking about um, negative things about their bodies, uh, about the way that they look, that might be a sign of that increased anxiety. Next one is a constant report of negative interactions. So constantly talking about fights over social media or negative responses from friends or other people. Keep an ear out for that because that might mean that they're starting to have some issues with anxiety um, as they're going through and using these different platforms. And this last one underneath the increased anxiety is avoidant behavior. So um, consistently not wanting to participate in family activities or school activity activities because they don't want to miss something on social media or they fear if they get off the grid for too long, they're going to miss out on something. Um, so then we see next increased depression. Um, so this might be different things like uh, tearfulness, crying more, um, crying at something um, very quickly or just tearfulness when, you know, it doesn't even seem to be a trigger or something like that. Um, and be more acutely aware when you see those kinds of things of just crying for um, either small or seemingly no reason. The next one is isolation. So I think we, <laughs> we see this a lot. Um, isolating activities like staying in their room, or always having their headphones in. A certain amount of that is, of course, 
very, very normal. And we want to normalize that for our, both our teens and our parents, letting them know yeah, that, that happens. Um, but it, when it's getting to the point that we're isolating so much from family that um, we never see them or we never talk to them or we're noticing that they just, they're, you know, living in their own little worlds and we can't draw them out. Next one is this loss of interest in activities. That's a really big sign of um, depression. Things that they used to enjoy that they no longer get enjoyment out of, or they say, which I'm sure a lot of families hear, because I hear it all the time as a counselor, um, I'm just not motivated. I just don't feel like it. I just don't want to. Um, so that could be a sign of depression. And then this last one is trouble focusing. And this is outside of just our, you know, um, general distraction and, you know, uh, everyday life. This is more so of they just can't get anything done. They can't focus for more than five minutes um, on a single activity or um, assignment or something like that. So these are different ways to talk to your child about social media use. Um, and this is kind of getting us to our, okay, what, what can I do to help my child or my teen? Um, first one is ask questions to learn and to understand. Social media has changed a ton, even since I was young. Um, in my day, it was MySpace and it was Facebook. Um, now there are so many platforms I can't keep up. Um, I'm constantly asking my teenage clients uh, what the new social media platform is and stuff, and they actually get a real kick out of that. They laugh at me because I don't, I don't know any of them anymore. Um, but what I really like to encourage my parents is uh, try to avoid, when you are asking these questions to learn and understand, try to avoid then diving into the lecture or the criticism. Um, <laughs> how many people have said, like, I'm going to turn off all your social media if it's going to cause you so much anxiety or if it's going to cause you so much, you know, so many issues socially, right? Um, but us going to that really often leaves them of feelings of being misunderstood and pushed away. Um, trust me, I'm a parent. I love giving a good lecture, even though I'm a counselor and I know it's sometimes not the best way to communicate with my kid. Um, I always say we can educate without lecturing. Lecturing comes from a place of um, I know better than you and it often is reactionary to a situation. Educating, on the other hand, comes from a place of, I want you to be prepared for what is to come. And it, we do this preventatively before a problem occurs. The next one is reflecting and responding. So if a problem does occur, we wanna reflect and we wanna respond. And what that means is we're gonna reflect their feelings back to them and we're just gonna to respond to them emotionally. You feel really sad when that person said that. You're really angry that your friend ghosted you. And this really helps them to feel heard and understood. Next, we're gonna talk about other considerations for social media. Um, a large one is uh, suicidal ideations and self-interest behavior. Um, this is the time when uh, uh, previous people were mentioning that if we have young ears, this might be a good time for our young ears to step away because this is um, a pretty serious and also can be upsetting, especially to young children, the subject. Um, but within suicidal ideations and self-injurious behavior, the biggest thing I wanted to address is this idea of contagion. We have this term contagion when it comes to um, death by suicide. When there's a death by suicide in a school or a community or a family, we're often going to see an increase in suicidal ideations or death by suicide in other people who are connected to that person who died. Um, because of social media, people are far more connected with other people in their communities and other schools, places across town, that kind of stuff, than ever before. Um, previous to social media, contagion was generally just within a, a school or maybe a city or something like that. But we're seeing it now spreading more um, because of social media. And oh, a student knows a, a, a kid over at the school who, the, you know, and that kind of stuff. They're so much more connected. Um, so when there is a death by suicide of a student from, let's say, west side of Columbus, this could still impact our students in Reynoldsburg because they know them on TikTok or they knew them from Snapchat or something like that. The next thing to consider is every family is different. So um, let, let's celebrate those differences and, you know, really recognize what works and is considered okay in one family might not necessarily be the case in another. Uh, we make a lot of recommendations and general guidelines, um, but there are very few hard and fast rules. So make decisions based on what is best for your individual family. 
as Andrea has stated, this is a, a lot of information and it can be overwhelming to everyone, but just remember that when we work with kids, we really take into consideration people's culture, your home values, and we look at all of your needs and we just don't come in and just tell you what to do. I know the school councils will talk about resources they, they have, but we also have um, resources at um, onoursleeves.org, and I'm sure David and the rest of the team could send that to you. But that's free resources for how to speak to your children about the supportive services that you need. Um, and anything you need, just let your school counselor know and they know how to reach us. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. And you can see the resources right there. Thank you guys so much. Ed and Andrea, thank you both so very much for sharing your expertise and your insight with us this evening. And just in general, also thank you for the partnership. Um, it has proven to be such a powerful partnership. And um, I heard the rumor that we were your favorite partner out there. I don't know if that's true or not, but we'll go with that. And I'm sure all those listening will keep that secret because we wouldn't want the other schools out there to, to hear that rumor. Um, but nonetheless, thank you. Thank you so much for everything you're doing for our community right now. Um, with that, we're going to turn things over um, to another partnership that we have here in Reynolds York City Schools, and that is with the Reynoldsburg Police Department. Um, I was an assistant principal at Reynoldsburg High School years and years ago when uh, we first got an, a school resource officer in the high school. Um, and at first we were wondering, oh my gosh, you know, how are we going to incorporate a police officer into our day-to-day our -day routines? Um, what is this going to look like? Um, but it has also proven to be one of the most powerful partnerships um, we as a school can have to have this connection with our local law enforcement to make those connections with families and with students on, an, on a daily basis. And to know that we now have two SROs working with our schools, um, it makes it just twice as, as, as wonderful. So um, we're going to, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Damon Ferrone and Michelle Fulton, who are both um, police officers with Brownsburg Police Department and as well the school resource officers within our high schools and that serve our other buildings as well. And they're going to talk to us tonight about social media from the legal perspective. So officers, it is all yours. Well, good evening. Um, I'm Officer Fulton with uh, Reynoldsburg Police and I am at the Livingston campus. However, we also will deal with um, all the city schools um, so just because your school doesn't have a uh, resource officer, um, we are always contacted and keep in good touch with all of our principals. Uh, so some of the things that we're seeing are the issues students face online, um, are the inappropriate contents, online privacy, sexting, online sexual solicitation, and the cyberbullying. These are some big topics that we deal with day in and day out and also um, our patrol officers have a lot of the issues because of the bullying. Um, and the definition for the bullying is an aggressive, unwanted behavior used again and again to isolate, harm, or control another person. Um, and a lot of times this is done uh, verbally, socially, uh, physical, and then the cyber bullying. Uh, so it's very important that we're realizing that the social media that our our kids are going into their bedrooms and they can be bullied at any place. It's not just at the schools. Um, they can take it home with them. Um, and sometimes they're afraid to say something to you. So they'll go on their social media and they always have an audience. Uh, there's a couple of situations that we've had that it was like three in the morning and they had several um, hundred children that were listening to somebody else cut down and humiliate another student. Um, and then as we're coming into school, we're like, wow, what happened already before they even um, got to the school? So being aware of what your student is doing or, or your child is doing um, is huge. Uh, watching what they're sending, posts, uh, sharing negative and false uh, or means of content. Uh, making sure that their profiles, a lot of them, they want those likes like uh, a couple of you guys were saying earlier and they want to be viewed. Uh, so they leave their profiles open, um, not locking them down, not having any privacy to them. Uh, so make sure we're talking to our uh, children about that, making sure that they know the people that are following them and not just trying to get a big number because uh, that's where it's potentially going to cause a lot of issues. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
So the cyberbullying um, we've been hearing about, but there's an estimate as many as 16,000 kids miss school every day, uh, every day due to the fear um, of attack or intimidation just because of our social media. Um, one in six high school students have seriously considered uh, suicide because of these things. Um, and then we've noticed like one in 12 um, have, attempt, have, have attempted to do this. And now with the, the COVID, um, we're noticing an increase, not only with our kids, but in adults uh, with this increase in um, the social or the suicides. So making sure that we're aware of what our children are doing. Um, also making sure with those smartphones that we understand the social media, um, the geolocations um, going on there, making sure our phones are locked down because if we have a predator, especially with us and having the younger children, um, they're able to find that just through that uh, GPS and talking to the kids. Uh, so make sure that your kids, um, when they're dealing with the cyberbullying or potential online enticement, um, for you to report it to the police. Uh, if there's, as far as like the bullying, if one of your students, if one of your kids you feel are getting bullied, um, make sure that you're making like a log and keeping notes. And a lot of times I'll talk to the students, they'll approach me in the cafeteria or through the halls asking me different things. Um, but for the police, we definitely need to see that there's uh, a constant like, okay, on this date and time, this is what they said, make sure that we're um, documenting it, make sure that you're taking screenshots because a lot of times it'll disappear. Uh, we do have ways of going back into the phone to try to pull these things up, um, but sometimes they're lost. So making sure you're making that documentation. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you some of the things that we would unfortunately this can lead to um, is charges. So this telephone communication harassment, uh, to put it into easier terms, it's uh, if you look at it, it says no person shall knowingly make a cause to be made a telephone communication. That's anywhere, that's over the telephone, that's on your computer, that's a gaming system, um, telephone, any of those are all considered under the device. Uh, and if you look down at the bottom, the misdemeanor, the first degree, this is like the highest misdemeanor before it goes into a felony. Uh, so that's, the, with us, it's 90 days possibly in jail uh, and a $1,000 fine. So these are pretty evident that we want to make sure that our kids are understanding uh, that some of the stuff that they're doing and abusing another person, doing the intimidation or harassment can also lead to criminal charges. Um, and then you, if you look down further, it also show that uh, these, if they've been com convicted of them at one time, it can also be enhanced to a felony later. Uh, the next slide. Uh, I believe Andrea spoke mostly on uh, some of these things, but making sure that we're aware of having um, the poor eating habits and stuff that you'll see. A lot of us, while we're in the cafeteria, it's a huge place for us officers to go and observe and interact with uh, your students. Um, so making that, that conversation with them um, is probably the best. Uh, just making sure you're making that contact and talking to them, asking, watching, especially the, the sleep habits with them being up on that phone all night long and the glowing screen if you just pop your head in there and, and pay attention to those things. And I'll let uh, Damon take over with the next slide. So I'm going to talk about cyberbullying with the online enticement. Online enticement is going to involve an individual communicating with someone believed to be a child via the internet with the intent to commit a sexual offense or abduction. It's a broad category of online exploitation and includes extortion in which a child is being groomed to take sexually explicit images, ultimately meet face to face with someone for sexual purposes or engage in a sexual conversation online. In some instances, sell or trade child sexual images. So this type of victimization takes place across every platform of social media. 
messaging apps, gaming platforms, Facebook, Instagram, everything. So I know some of these folks have already reiterated, but you're going to hear it again. Parents need to be involved in what their kids are looking at. You got to oversee who they're who they're following, who's following them when they're live, you know, and, and basically who they're communicating with. You go to the next slide, please. Some of the tactics and goals of online enticement would be engaging in sexual conversation or role playing, asking the child for sexually explicit images of themselves or mutually sharing images. Certain online behaviors may increase the risk of victimization, such as lying about being older in order to access certain platforms, sending explicit photos or videos known as sex of one, oneself to another user. So the goal of online enticement vary, but most commonly offenders seem to want to extort additionally sexually explicit images from the child. So as kids grow and develop, they naturally become more interested in relationships and sex. So one way they pursue experiences or information is through sexting. So obviously it's, it's a hard conversation to have with parents. I have kids too. Um, Sexting is sharing receiving sexually explicit messages and nude or partially nude images via cell phone. So being in a cell phone for several years, um, this is pretty common. Kids that are dating, they think it's okay to share pictures of themselves mutually, but when that relationship is over after a week or two, now these kids have pictures of each other and they can send them out to each to other people. They're out there, you can never get them back, you know, they're, and who knows how many people see them. Um, they could be sent as regular text messages through apps, Snapchat and WhatsApp. Um, they may uh, sex for a variety of reasons. They may be trying to establish intimacy with a boyfriend or girlfriend, impress a crush or somebody, try and be funny. And others may feel pressured by boyfriends or girlfriends who may threaten to break up with them if they don't send a picture. So a lot of times they'll have a picture and then they'll say, hey, if you don't do this for me, I'm going to send this picture of you out to everybody. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is a big, long uh, Ohio Revised Code for pandering obscenity. Um, it basically speaks of um, material, obscene material. We'll we'll talk about it in the, in regard to juveniles. So the way it defines obscene materials harmful to juveniles. It's the, the quality of any material or performance describing or representing nudity, sexual conduct, sexual excitement, or sadomasochistic abuse in any form. So that's for, we're talking about juveniles only. This pertains to everybody. So again, if you look at the bottom, it says whoever violates the section is guilty of pandering obscenity. It's a felony of the fifth degree. You go to the next slide, please. So in regards to sexting and sextortion, teens may not believe or be able to foresee a situation in which the person they send a sex to sharing that image with others. It does happen and the consequences can be academically, socially, and emotionally devastating. You wanna go? Okay. Michelle? The next uh, one, your teens, oh. uh, your teens that uh, sex may get in trouble for at the school, be bullied or harassed in extreme cases, get in legal trouble um, with us. I've had several cases last year um, that I had to deal with. Uh, and unfortunately, these students don't know that how much trouble this could be. A felony is huge, and that's gonna remain with you. Even though you're a juvenile, that's not gonna go away. Um, and depending on the content, you could actually be put onto uh, the website um, and be known as a predator uh, depending on how involved this gets. So making sure that we're telling our uh, teenagers and even our younger children that this is something that is going to be carried on with you um, and it doesn't go away after that. Um, so making sure um, like the sextortion, the practice used by the offenders to acquire additional sexual content from the child, coerce them into engaging in sexual activity or obtaining money um, from the children because they will, they'll, they'll put something against this child and then they'll have a picture or something and then they'll
tell them that, well, if you tell anybody or you tell your parents, I'm going to let this out, I'm going to give this, send this to your parent. Um, and right away, the, the child doesn't want to have any of that happen or let their parents know that this position or uh, picture content that they had sent out um, that they actually did. Uh, if you go to the next one, please. So the peer research um, surveys, the teens were split on whether social media had the most positive or most negative effects on their life. Um, some of the positive elements are just connecting with their friends and family, which I'm sure we all can agree. Uh, I know that I have a lot of friends that are out of state, and this is like the only way that I can keep in contact with them. Um, easy access for news and information. I mean, how easy is it to, we get flashes across our screen constantly with banners telling us things that are going on, and then meeting with others um, with similar interests that we might not even know exist. Uh, but unfortunately, there are a lot of negatives also. The bullying, because you're not being seen face to face, so somebody can do a lot more behind that screen, um, not in contact with that person, um, pretending to be somebody they aren't. Uh, lack of that's where the lack of personal contact uh, comes in, and then the unrealistic views of others' lives, um, because they can make up and be whoever they want, and this person on the other end might not be that at all, but they have this person uh, believing that. Uh, also, letting your uh, child know that all those social media pack that you go on to, the Snapchat, your um, Instagram, um, a lot of those photos and stuff that are put on there, it's shown that 88% of those self made explicit images are stolen from the original upload and made available on the websites, particularly pornography sites collecting sexual image of children and young people. Um, so make sure that they know anytime that you go on to any of those sites, they'll have a uh, legal disclaimer at the beginning that you have to agree to. And what you are agreeing to, if you would actually read that whole couple paragraphs that are going through there, is they're telling you that you are turning those pictures over to them and that they now own those pictures and can do whatever they want with them. Um, and when I try to explain that to some of the students, uh, their mouths drop because they just they have to agree to it to be on that site. Uh, so just being careful, and I always tell them that you know, um, if you wouldn't send that photo to me, your grandmother, or your mother, um, then don't put it out there. Uh, you can go on to the next one. So the social media um, sites and apps: Facebook, Snapchat, chat, Twitter, Instagram, um, and music. We one I'm not familiar with, uh, require the users to be at least 13 years of age. So be careful with um, when you have these younger students that are getting on there because um, the use will be untruthful about their date of birth um, in order to gain access. And then accessing these platforms before the age of 13 of young children, it increases the risk to encounter the inappropriate, inappropriate content um, from these contactors and users. Is there anything good there? No, that's it. Again, just to reiterate, you've got to be involved with your kids and their social media. Uh, there's too many platforms out there designed to hide things from parents. So just be aware of uh, what your kids are doing and, and try and control um, what type of social media that they're on and, and who they're following and who's following them. And I think we're done. Thank you. Officer Fulton, Officer Frum, thank you so very much for um, also sharing your expertise tonight. And, and as well, thank you for um, interacting with our students on such a daily, on a, on a daily basis. You know, your interaction with them and your observations and getting to know them um, is one more tool we have to make sure that they successfully um, get across that stage and, and get to that point where they can thrive in, in what their futures are going to be. So we appreciate your partnership and your being um, involved with our students every day. So again, thank you. Um, the next slide does have your contact information there. So parents, guardians out there, um, if you want to take note of that contact information, um, in case you have questions, um, you know, it is there for, for you to certainly have access to our school resource officers. So parents, um, guardians, caregivers, you have heard from our building principals. 
um, about some of those um, positive aspects of social media that we see in our schools, as well as some things to kind of avoid that we notice on a regular basis. Um, we have heard from our mental health partners at Nationwide Children's in terms of the signs that students might be struggling with, um, some interactions of, of cyberbullying and social media. And then we've heard those, that legal aspect. And so now you're asking, okay, if I notice these things in my child, what do I do? What's my next step? Mm -hmm. Who do I do? And we are so very lucky in our district to have a dedicated and get gifted mental health team um, to serve our students and to serve our families. And we have two of those uh, members of the, the mental health team with us tonight. Um, Allison Pence Ward is a social worker with our Reynoldsburg High School East End Academy. And Ali Huntsberger is a social worker with our Reynoldsburg High School 9X Impact Academy. And tonight they're gonna talk to you and, and take some time to talk through what are the supports that are already in place that you as parents, caregivers, guardians can tap into um, when you need help with these things. So um, Allison and Ali, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Baker. As um, David shared, I'm Allie Huntsberger. I'm the social worker at the 9X Impact at Reynoldsburg High School over at the Livingston campus. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight with you. Thank you all for taking the time to be here and, and have a conversation, um, in, in, some, in some ways a hard conversation about a really important topic. Um, as Mr. Baker shared, Allison and I are gonna basically share with you, okay, who's the first person I should contact if I'm concerned about my child, um, whether that's they're being cyber bullied, um, you're concerned about their mental health or self-esteem related to their social media usage. And um, as Andrew was sharing, looking at all those Instagram influencers and you're worried that maybe a child's really struggling with their self-esteem as, as a result of that. Um, what we've done is actually we've created a new section of our website called Student and Family Resources. So as you can see on this screen, um, if you just go to the main ren.org page, um, you can see on that screen that there's a, there's a new tab at the top that's called Student and Family Resources, and I believe we're gonna open it up here. So if you go to that tab on the top that says Student and Family Resources, and then scroll down to where it says Student and Family Resources and click that link, you'll be able to find this page, and if we can just scroll down a bit. Okay, you'll be able to find this page where you see this heading that says Meet the RCS Mental Health Team. So what we've done is we've put together, um, one, you can see a lot of the crisis lines are here. So if your student is in a behavioral health emergency, um, there's resources for that um, available right here on this page. Um, there are also several other crisis lines available here. Additionally, if you see that link that says, click here to download contact information to reach student support team members, this is the most important part. This is where you can find the contact information, landing pages, virtual offices, phone numbers, emails, anything that you would need to get in touch with your school social workers or school counselors at any building. So we thought it might be helpful for parents to have this contact information all in one place so you can really easily find it. Even if you have multiple kids at different buildings, it's all here in the same space. Um, so we are, as Mr. Baker shared, really lucky to have so many school social workers and school counselors here in the district who are equipped with many, many resources. Um, and a lot of times, truly, parents just don't know where to find them and don't know what resources are already available in their building. So this is a super easy way for you to find that contact information, no matter what building or academy um, your student is in. Um, depending on what that student's need is, we'll, we'll be able to figure out what we can, what that student, what we can, what supports we can provide for that student. Um, I am, if we can go back to the presentation, at this point, um, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Pence Ward. Hi, like Mr. Baker introduced, I am Allison Pence Ward, the school social worker at East Dim Academy. And um, I'm gonna, if we can go to the next slide, I'm gonna share um, kind of what some of these inter interventions and supports actually look like in our schools. And when we're talking about different interventions and supports, we usually tend to kind of talk about tier one, tier two, and tier three. So tier one interventions are gonna be those interventions that really are getting to all the students in the school. And so um, one of the things that the district's, uh, district has put a lot of effort in over the past couple years is social emotional learning. Um, some of you might not be aware, but the Ohio Department of Education has actually put out standards just like they do with math and English and social studies. They've done that also for social emotional learning. So now 
our kids, depending on what age and grade level they are, they um, are kind of learning about a lot of these different topics. It's being implemented in their curriculum and maybe in their homerooms or their advisories or maybe with their school counselors or social workers. So some of the topics like cyberbullying, healthy relationships, boundaries, um, you know, doing making safe decisions. And so uh, a lot of that's kind of going on to all students. Another thing that uh, the district has been um, kind of implementing in some of our schools is restorative practices. So that's going to be, you know, if a student has done something um, to hurt another student and kind of using some of those restorative circles and restorative practices so they can see how um, what they did has really impacted and hurt someone. And um, we'll do a lot kind of, with, like I said, with circles and, and things like that. So then our tier two, that's going to be uh, the different interventions and support that like your school social worker, your school counselor, and also we are partnered with some different uh, prevention specialists. I'll, I'll kind of talk about that on our next slide. But um, the school social worker and counselor, they can often provide um, individual kind of check in and supports. We might pr provide like small groups based on certain topics, kind of the needs of the building or what we're kind of finding out from students. Um, and then also we have um, outside counseling that we can refer students to. Um, I've talked with a lot of parents. I was just kind of talking with a parent a couple of weeks ago who had reached out to me um, and said that, you know, they're really wanting to get their child. They're really concerned about their child and they you know wanted to get them into counseling. They were maybe going to talk to their doctor and things like that. And I think it was really helpful for them to find out that those are things that we can help with is because we do have those partnerships like we were talking about earlier with like nationwide children's and I'm going to share some of those other partnerships. But sometimes we can even get students in faster than if you um, kind of went on your own and then you might be put on a waiting list because we have some counselors that work with, you know, just Reynoldsburg students. And so that's something that we just want parents to know that if you do want some extra support, we do have different levels of support and we just want you to be aware of them because oftentimes I think parents can feel alone and w one of our roles is, is to support, you know, not only students, but also our families and our parents and how we can, you know, support you best with your child. And if we could go to the next slide. So some of these partnerships that we do have. So we already had mentioned our new partnership, which we're super excited about, is Nationwide Children's. Um, we have some counselors that are working with Reynoldsburg students. And then we also uh, work with Southeast Healthcare. Uh, here at uh, Summit Campus, we have a, a Southeast Healthcare Prevention Specialist. She's here every single day. She works with Encore students and Eastern students. And there's a lot of people like that in some of the other buildings too. Um, and then we're also partnered with some um, different places like United Methodist Children's Home and Buckeye Ranch. So just really want you guys to know that we do have supports here at school if your child is struggling. Um, if, if you notice something on social media, whether it's about your child or maybe another child in our school district and, and you don't know who to go to, um, going to your school social worker, your counselor, uh, sometimes even students, I know that they feel comfortable talking with their teachers because they have, you know, they spend a lot of time with their teachers and they have good relationships with their teachers. And oftentimes then the teachers will reach out to us. Um, we've had parents kind of let us know things that they've seen online. And so just letting you know, that's what we're here for. And um, I'll go ahead and turn it over back to you, Mr. Baker. Great. Thank you, Allison and Allie, for sharing this information with us tonight and as well for um, all you do every day also for um, with supporting our students. And uh, I know when one of them is in need, um, we can always turn to one of the members of our own internal mental health team to, to be right there at their side and help them through whatever that crisis is. So again, thank you. And parents, um, like they said, this is your first line of contact and you, you have that uh, page on the website that you can turn to um, should you need to reach one of them as well. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our Chief Academic Officer with Reynoldsburg City Schools. Um, Jocelyn Cosgrave, who um, stumbled upon this incredible um, uh, documentary and um, was really um, excited about it after she had watched it and brought it to us um, one day at work and thought it would be a great tie in to this topic also. So um, she's going to share with you her perspective of watching that that uh, documentary and as well um, what was kind of going through her mind um, as a mom watching that documentary. So with that, Dr. Cosgrave. Thank you, Mr. Baker. And this has been a great presentation. Um, I've even learned a lot in planning um, and helping plan this. And 
Um, so I just really appreciate all of the partnerships that we have to make sure that our students are safe. Um, my part is short and sweet. Um, I actually was approached by um, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Ed Johnson. He he works in our district as a special assistant to the superintendent. And um, Mr. Johnson and I have a lot of great conversations, but he actually watched um, The Social Dilemma on Netflix um, and came into my office both excited and scared, I think, about what he had uh, just watched on, on Netflix related to The Social Dilemma. Um, but this is a documentary, if you've not seen it, um, that interviews um, the very tech experts who created social media. Um, these are the people who um, know the intent of the companies um, that control social media and therefore control us. Um, and they speak about it very, very candidly. Um, I think that they all admit throughout the film that they had no idea um, what would happen with social media because its original intent is not now what it's it's become. Um, but as a parent, um, I really felt like watching it would be the best option after Mr. Johnson explained it to me, just so that I could talk to my own 14 year old about social media. He had been begging me for social media for quite some time. And we had a lot of conversations about, is it safe? Is it not um, his digital footprint? Like we've talked about. And so before I um, decided that I would let him have his first social media account, we watched this documentary together. Um, and he to this day talks about that um, and, and how he was impacted by the information. Um, because what you realize through this documentary is there truly is both an art and a science behind um, social media. Um, there is a whole website um, that you can go to called Start a Conversation, and the link is there. Um, and when you go to the website, it talks about the whole project behind this documentary. So you can access um, the film, or like I said, you can watch it on Netflix. It talks about what is the dilemma in the social dilemma. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit, um, you'll actually even see um, a discussion guide that you could use with students or with your children. Um, you can scroll on down. There's even a bingo card. Um, you can play family bingo to really um, confess uh, our own obsessions with social media. Um, so it's things like, um, have you ever, um, gotten into a heated debate on social media with a stranger? Have you ever unfriended someone because you don't like their views? So this is just kind of a fun way to start a conversation, um, as if are those who are begging for social media, um, I found these tools to be, um, a great um, way to start the conversation at home. So I highly encourage you to watch it. It's a great place to start. I'm very thankful uh, that I have this in mind as I'm closely monitoring my son on social media. So schools, um, Nationwide Children's Hospital again, and the Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation as we talk about youth suicide awareness and prevention. Um, so again, a heavy conversation, but one that I think is timely and one that um, we all need to, to have that good understanding of those, of those signs and how to best help our kids when they're in crisis. I'm gonna, I said I was going to leave you with a challenge. And since we got done a little early um, and it is, I'm looking out my window and it looks like it's a beautiful night out there, um, you were given some tools tonight. And so I would encourage you to take um, these 25 minutes that you were going to sit in front of your screen and, and listen to us talk, um, maybe go for a walk around the block with your kiddo and try one of these conversation starters or, or begin that conversation around social media and how um, your particular kiddo might use it um, for good and how maybe they're experiencing some of those um, um, tougher situations and how you now are equipped uh, to begin those conversations and help them. With that, again, thank you all so very, very much um, for entrusting your children to us every single day. And we look forward to the next event um, one month from now at the end of April. Have a great night, everyone, and thank you.